Pfizer is accused of making misleading claims over its COVID vaccine by the UK's pharmaceutical watchdog. They say that Pfizer has discredited the industry. This, as the uh, Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting, has said today in an interview with The Sun, that there will be no extra funding for the NHS under a Labour government without the, what he calls, major surgery of reform. Well, let's talk about both these subjects with Carl Hennigan, who's Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Oxford. Good morning to you, Carl. Good morning, Julia. Thanks for joining us. Well, I mean, look, this, you know, COVID once again, we're talking about it, COVID inquiry, of course, ongoing. Will we ever get to the bottom of lots of decisions? But this is, I mean, this is extraordinary because this is actually a ruling by the pharmaceutical watchdog um, about Pfizer, particularly their senior executives using social media back in 2020, before the formal licensing of their COVID vaccine, to say basically it's brilliant and make loads of claims about it that simply weren't true and they've finally been wrapped over the knuckles for it. Is this a little bit too late, too little? Well, yeah, what's happened here is that a senior executive in Pfizer in the UK tweeted a study about the conclusions prior to marketing approval and that's a breach by promoting an unlicensed medicine. You can't do that. It's, it's if you do that, you're breaking the law. You can get fined or you can actually get imprisonment. What's interesting about, though, is the derisory fine that actually Pfizer received. It was £34,800. Now, to put that into context, in 2021, on the back of the vaccines, Pfizer earned in excess of £81 billion in revenues. So the fine is roughly about 17 seconds worth of those revenues. Yeah. It's like asking you to say, Julia, broke the law, it'll cost you one pence. Yeah. Now, the thing is, this is not unusual because Pfizer has had six breaches throughout the COVID pandemic. And it was only in November 2022 when their chief executive was promoting childhood vaccines and actually giving information that was m misleading. And for that, he was also seen to be in breach of the code. So the problem here is what's called the Prescriptions Medicines Code of Practice Authority is a self-regulatory body. It sort of gives you a little slap on the wrist, mm. but it certainly does nothing to stop the practice. And what we've seen is the company comes out and the executive in the UK said it was unintentional and accidental. Nothing about the way the industry operates is that <laughs> unintentional yeah. and accidental. This is about getting out there the information in a world where the amount of money to be made is huge. Yeah, and indeed it's very noticeable, you know, from AstraZeneca, of course that was you know, funded by the government, some of that research, and, and they weren't making the profit on it, whereas other, other uh, pharmaceutical companies made a fortune. It was interesting, wasn't it? We went from believing that, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies were, who again and again had put drugs on the market, which they were lying about the results and the testing, which caused, you know, and, and massive big cover-ups of, of the injuries they were causing, to suddenly believing every single thing that these one wonderful angelic organisations were doing um, and not paying full attention. Do you still think that we need to have some sort of investigation into vaccine harms in this country? There's still con concerns about excess deaths. Do we need to have some proper acknowledgement of this? Yeah, so there are two different things here going on. The first is, Julia, you're right. There seems to be becoming no-go areas where if you criticise or ask questions, COVID vaccines are one of them, transgender and the treatment of children has been one of them, and that's a real issue. If you can't be critical and in being critical, ask important questions. How are we ever to learn what the truth is? The second issue is there's been a noticeable increase in excess deaths from about mid-21, 22 onwards. And in doing so, we've asked for investigations time and time again, but the country, the UK, brushes it off. It's noticeable that actually the Australian Senate is the first country to break rank and says, we are going to investigate and look at excess deaths. I also think with this issue, there's a real need to look at the safety and the regulator, start to ask questions of the MHRA, because it's certainly a problem with safety reporting. We have a yellow card system that nobody knows exists hardly, but should be reporting all the time the adverse events, and there are still lots of unknowns. So I think we need a root and branch approach to how we look at excess yeah. deaths and how we look at safety. Absolutely. Now, look, I've left far too little time, and I do apologise that I took a caller for a long time a little bit earlier. But um, Wes Street, the Labour Shadow Health Secretary, wants to be a health secretary in a few months' time, has warned the NHS there'll be no additional funding without what he called major surgery under Labour. Do you think an awful lot of the, the health workers, a lot of health unions, are going to be rather surprised and disappointed by uh, Labour getting in because they think that's the answer to all their problems with the NHS? Do you think that's not the case? 
Well, look, there are systemic problems now in the NHS that need an overhaul. I agree with that. Number one is particularly the waiting list. I mean, 7.8 million, but the Telegraph reported it could be 10 and the Times said it could be 11 million. Bearing in mind, you, you so still work real... in, in, in a hospital yeah. as well. You're not I'm just still off working in academia. In, yeah. I can tell you there are structural problems in the NHS that are real issues. The most important problem is is how do we get doctors in front of people? When you get in front of a doctor, the service is world-class, but there are structural issues. The key here, though, is I think is what's the role of government and then what's the role of who's in charge? Because whoever's in charge of the NHS should be accountable for all these failings. Is it the government or is it NHS England? Okay. And exactly. I think we need to separate those two issues out and okay. come to a conclusion of what's the role of the government and the NHS Absolutely. England.